What an intriguing thought when we think of those 120 gathered in that room, earnestly praying, seeking the Lord's will, and seeking also the ongoing work of the church, that they might carry on the work that Christ had commissioned them to do so. What of their thinking, their backgrounds? We know so little of many of them, not even in the Gospels, let alone subsequent events of church history. What of the other 120? What of the Lord Jesus' brothers? Although we, we think Jude, is, who wrote the letter, is one of his half-brothers. What also of those 500 to whom Christ had appeared all at one event. But here they were from many walks of life, united together in purpose, in love, and in faith, following the Lord Jesus. What is it that would hold this group together? What is it that holds us together if people were to do a survey of our life, our background, our, where we live in our community, our income status, and, and so many other ideas that people could categorize individuals within the church. How can a group of such disparate people come together? And yet this is the question for the church. We thought about that even in our study in the letter to the Ephesians. How would Jew and Gentile be together? Well, it is through the love of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and that common purpose that unites us with confidence, proclaiming who Jesus is. But what were they waiting for? Well, it was a person to come, the Holy Spirit. What then are the marks of the church that we see clearly in this passage? Well, firstly, as you look at those verses 12 to 14, unity marks the church. So it says marvelously in verse 14, these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication, with one accord. Thinking of not only the list of names, but there was 120 people there with one accord. We are met here with one accord. We are gathered with one purpose. But as we leave this meeting of God's people, are we still of one accord? Are we still seeking the Lord together and serving him together in love? We do meet and share an interest in the Lord Jesus Christ. But it's more than an interest that we share. We share Christ. If we are Christian people here this morning, we have been saved through that single event, Christ's death upon the cross, one price paid for all who have come in repentance and faith. And you have been set aside, sanctified as saints, redeemed, and each day we trust becoming more like the Lord Jesus. But these men and women who were gathered in this room, largely they would have been Jewish, as, as we can probably imagine. And they were very aware of being a people together. The whole idea of being a covenant people, God having entered into a promise with them, and the very promise held out to them through the sacraments of the Old Testament church were those outward signs that sealed the promise. Even Jews scattered throughout the nations as they had been in their history had this idea of unity. But now this needed a new sense of unity to extend to the Gentile world. And this new unity was through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, through love between Jew and Gentile, and a purpose that would extend where the church itself would be a light to all the world. But what is fundamental here in these times, this particular historical moment, is that they had been witnesses of the resurrected Jesus. They had seen him. 
It doesn't give an indication in, in Scripture of Mary meeting the risen Jesus. But we presume by the nature of the account that she must have done. Could you imagine that? The one who stood by the cross of her son, watching him die, meeting him raised from the tomb. Of those also gathered who had doubted, who had denied the Lord Jesus, having seen the risen Jesus victorious over death. You see how the resurrection is central to the message how we carry on. How it is explained to us as Christ explained to those friends in Emmaus, those back in Jerusalem, teaching from the scriptures, from Moses, from the prophets, from the Psalms, that these things should be. How the word of God challenges us. How we thought also of those in the Reformation in Scotland stood even to the point of death, being loyal to the word of God. The disciples, though, at the very heart of this meeting, were saddened by a great disappointment, Judas's betrayal. Here was one who had been part of their ministry. Here is one who had experienced all these things and the teaching and all the miracles that he had seen and obviously also had been one of the Twelve who had gone out and in the name of Jesus had sown, seen healings and had seen those delivered from evil spirits. There were also those who had been three years with Jesus. They were there waiting in obedience, waiting expectantly for the promised coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. But Judas was not there. Friends of Jesus were there. The brothers and, and sisters of one another were there. And Mary and the half-brothers of Christ were there. James and John were there. Who had soon off been arguing and been called by nickname the Sons of Thunder. Their mother had stuck her nose in the business too and uh, with Christ. Who was the greatest in the kingdom now they they were changed men. It wasn't, it wasn't James and John. It was the Lord Jesus Christ sitting upon the throne whom they served. Peter, the one restored from his denial, and Andrew were effectively sure of their new career as being fishing, fishers of men. They had returned to fishing at Galilee for a short period. But they had firmly left those nets behind for the gospel net to gather men, women, and children into the kingdom. What can we say about all these people that were gathered? We can say while we admire them. Surely, as Paul writes, not many wise, noble, rich are called. But the foolish things of the world to confound worldly wisdom. The authorities of Herod or the priests or the Romans would have given this meeting little account. Who are these people? Fishermen, the unlearned, the despised tax collectors, a woman, a widow of a carpenter. And these people, some of them troublemakers in a past life, and would have mocked them and said, well, what about your Judas? What about him? We are reminded soberly by Paul in 2 Corinthians that we are jars of clay. Yes, we are jars of clay that God is working upon us and has the right to throw and re-throw again, taking and working out the blemishes through sanctification but we may be very plain on the outside and there is nothing attractive about us to the world. But that is important that people are not attracted to us, but attracted to is what Paul writes, we are containers for the treasure of the gospel. And as they would soon find out, the treasure of the presence of God, the Holy Spirit. 
Well, this unity was expressed here that they continued with one accord. What a lovely thought. Agreement in the church, as we sang about in Psalm 133, is a work of God, the Holy Spirit, just as unity in the priesthood. And then we sang in the Psalms, of, of, or we read in the Psalms, how those prophets, those priests of old, called upon the Lord. And there was unity, and God heard them and answered. Isn't it sweet? Isn't it refreshing in a weary world when there is agreement among the people of God? When there's agreement when we meet together in prayer? And as Christ even commanded the unity in prayer by which as we agree in the will of God, that God answers. But what are we to agree about in prayer? What are we to seek? Well, a very clear teaching on prayer, and we think of the Lord's prayer itself as, as that focus point. But he adds in Luke's gospel in chapter 11, encouraging us to ask of God to have a bold confidence, to seek of God to know that he will be found, and to go knocking on the door through prayer, assured that he will answer and give what we ask. Well, we could think that would be like finding a magic lantern with three wishes granted. What can I ask for? What can I seek for? What can I knock to be open for me? Well, before our minds would range over a, a tremendous wish list that we may have in our own hearts, the Lord focuses us in Luke chapter 11 to pray for something all three aspects of asking, seeking, and knocking for what? For who? Well, the very one that these people would have been praying for. So he says in Luke chapter 11, if you ask for the Holy Spirit, if you seek him, if you knock the door for him to be given to you, why would the Father not give to you? He will readily give to you the Holy Spirit. We're in such a better position than these who had witnessed the risen Savior. Gathered in unity, in a short time they would receive God the Holy Spirit. But we have him already. He has brought us to faith. He has preserved us. He has enabled us to grow in the faith and have confidence and assurance in Christ. He enables us to love, to worship, to pray, to reach out, to speak to others. We have unity and faith and purpose and also in prayer as these disciples had. We are real people. We know and love the Lord Jesus Christ. Unity marks the church. But what about Judas? That's where the critics would say, well, you are unified, but, but what about Judas? Isn't he the fly in the ointment? The great things that you're professing. We'll just sweep him under the carpet. Pretend that he didn't exist. And sometimes this is how the church deals with failure. But we see secondly in verses 15 to 20. Failure does not define the church. We do fail. There are great disappointments in the church. We disappoint one another we disappoint the Lord more importantly. There can be great disappointments where great efforts that we have undertaken for the church seem to bear no fruit. But we so often will be surprised when we get to heaven and find those who have heard, who did not respond at that time, who actually did come to know the Lord Jesus. There have been great Christian leaders that have been a disappointment. Evangelists, ministers, brothers and sisters in Christ who have disappointed in the things of the church. And yet we are warned. Failure can destroy congregations. It has happened. Where things not dealt with properly or a greater vision that has not been taken from the Lord that what unites people together has crumbled away and people have dispersed. 
Failure must not define the church because it does not define the universal church of the Lord Jesus Christ. And yes, Judas was a tremendous failure, one who had been with Jesus for so long, and perhaps next to the fall of Lucifer from the very heavenly host in the presence of God, there had not been so serious a, a failure. But all these things are according to the sovereignty of God and outside our understanding. But look at these disciples. Think of they themselves. They had been confused at times. The Lord had rebuked them. You've been with me so long and you still don't understand. Peter in one moment says, you're the son of the most high God. And the next minute, he is mouthing the words of Satan. Will not let you die. Will not let you go to Jerusalem. And Christ rebukes Satan speaking through Peter. There was denial. There was confusion. There was fear when they fled from the Lord. And even as we remember Mary and Christ's own brothers had doubted Jesus, telling him to, to come home, stop making a fool of himself, or, or stop being putting himself in danger. Yes, there are many failures, and we fail so often. But failure is not the end of the church. We will be presented the spotless bride at the return of the Lamb of God. But what there is in response to failure is repentance, forgiveness, reconciliation, and importantly, sanctification, where we learn as we continue to grow. Carry on. That is what the Lord said to the church. Carry on. The work continues. What a sweet just Judas underwell. He wasn't really one of our number. He wasn't really with us. We didn't really know him. After all, he was just a thief. To all purposes, they believed that, that Judas was one of the number and Christ had called him. We understand that. Was, was Christ wrong in calling him? For what purpose? So the matter of Judas had to be addressed. Not with, this is the end, we cannot continue. But how do we continue? How do we deal with his position within the apostles and how do we deal with the call to carry on? Well, guidance from Scripture was given. Let another take his place. Let us move on. The work is more important than one man's failure. These things happen. People fail the Lord. We have to deal with discouragements. We have to learn from failure, including our own. But Judas didn't learn, did he? He did not choose repentance and faith, but he chose remorse. There's no doubt in his remorse and his sorrow for what he had done. But there was no pursuit of reconciliation with the Lord Jesus. He simply did away with himself in a horrendous way that was heard throughout the whole of Jerusalem. But the work of the kingdom is greater than this one man's failure. Christ came to redeem, to reconcile, and to restore real people who feel the Lord Jesus. That is who he came to save, broken failures. And we are saved, and we're redeemed, we're reconciled, we're restored, and we're mended in the Lord Jesus Christ. Men need redemption and reconciliation and restoration. We need that. We proclaim it, but we need it ourselves when we feel. The church carries on. Man's failure will be overcome in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thirdly, as we look at verse 21 to 26, what is it defines the church? It's not failure. It is unity and also perseverance. That is important. And it has to be unity that perseveres as well. And it is not stopped by failures. Let another take his place. Followers of the risen Jesus were examined. And solemnly after prayer, they, there was a particular appointed way in which they chose. They drew lots. 
It's not a warrant for, for lots as such. But it was a manner that they had been guided to, and with much prayer, it was a means by which God demonstrated between these two men, both equally valid, both equally good men and followers of the Lord Jesus right from the beginning. And, and that's interesting in itself. It gives us a picture of, of the twelve and, and the others who accompanied them. And we know on one occasion there were 72 disciples that were mentioned. But here these were witnesses to Christ. As he went in and out among them from the beginning of the cross and of the resurrection. So who did they choose? Well, they, under God they chose Matthias. This man over Joseph, who was also known as Rufus. But they were both had been, or just as, as they had both been with Jesus. They would carry on serving Jesus. Joseph would carry on serving Jesus in his own manner. Perhaps becoming a deacon in the church, we don't know. But he would likewise be faithful and was no less a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ than Matthias, who was appointed to take the place of Judas among the apostles, but they had both been with Jesus. We know that from Christ's teaching and Paul's teaching, the value of each one within the body of Christ. Different gifts. Different backgrounds, different opportunities, but all vital one to the other. Some more public in our service, some quiet in our service. There are always dangers about public service, seeking accreditation for yourself, things you do not receive for private service. But both likewise, dangers in a sense for your pride, but both special opportunities to give glory to God that we do. Isn't it wonderful? God calls men, women, and children from all walks of life, all languages and cultures of this world throughout time to glorify God together and to persevere. You see, the church is made up universally and invisibly of believers. We're a visible body of people identifying with Christ, but we are real people. We are sinners saved by grace, serving the Lord Jesus Christ, and all for his glory. Whatever you are called to do in your daily diligence, do it unto the name of the Lord. By these things we do display the risen Christ in our midst. He is seen in our unity. That unity is seen in our perseverance. Greater than our failures that we deal with. So we be joined together in Christ. We're joined in faith. We're joined in love. We're joined in purpose. To show the risen Saviour. Amen.